This is episode 12 of Eco Gorillas, written and read by Scott A.J. Johnson. For more information, visit ecogorillas.com. That's gorilla with two R's and two L's. To support this project and get early access to all the chapters, head over to patreon.com slash S-A-J Johnson. If you've gotten this far, I hope you're enjoying it, so take a minute to tell a friend. If you've done that, please consider leaving this podcast a review on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you listen. And thanks. This podcast contains fleeting, explicit language. Chapter 25, Writing the Manifesto, Summer 2015. This place is a mess, said Lauren, surveying her living room. Every surface was covered with stacks of books, mountains of loose-leaf paper, coffee cups, pillows, blankets, and a spaghetti monster of cables connected to half a dozen laptops to an external hard drive. Nothing connected to the internet was plugged into this intranet. Online resources were accessed on a separate computer and physically transferred by flash drive. The fireplace was full of crumpled paper, and the old printer churned, groaned, and clicked ominously as it tried to keep up with the printouts. Huh? said Eric, the only one who had heard her. Oh yeah, maybe we should take a break to clean up. Maybe we'll leave the house for a change? We need groceries, paper, ink for the printer, and showers. Everybody needs a shower. Hey everybody, said Eric. Ava and Brett looked up. Let's get to a stopping point and take a break. Brett blinked, surveying the room. Yeah, you're right, a shower, shave, jog, and a real meal would be a big change. I can't believe it's Friday already. It's Saturday, said Lauren. And can we at least organize the piles? Yes, dear, said Ava. Oh, sorry, was that your line, Eric? A jog sounds good to me, said Eric. I'm going to do that, so maybe others can shower first? I'll join you, said Brett. Okay, but can we keep the talking down? Running clears my head of whatever I was doing, and new ideas usually pop up. You're the one that never shuts up on runs, so that'll be a welcome change for me, said Brett, turning to Lauren and Eva. Don't clean till we get back, please. Lauren scoffed. Don't worry, that won't be a problem. An hour later, everybody reconvened in the living room, considerably less smelly, wearing clean clothes, and looking refreshed. So where is everybody, asked Eric after they started tidying up. Well, I have the complete drafts of three of my four sections, said Ava, while she sorted printouts of her sections. I should be done with the fourth by this evening, and then I can start looking over other complete drafts. Are you sure you want to take on the editing, asked Brett. It isn't hard, she said. I've worked as a copy editor before. Well, in that case, I'll have the energy section done soon. I just want to look over it one more time. After that, I should be able to finish the education and population sections tomorrow morning, and the revolution bit is pretty much done now. Thanks for taking on energy, Brett, said Eric. That was a huge chunk. It's my meat and potatoes. It's all I think about anyway. I really enjoyed all my segments, added Lauren. Social organization, equity, and personal possessions are done. I've got a few more segments to polish off, but I think everything will be ready tomorrow. I'm about done too, said Eric. We're going to need to discuss the introduction and the segments we wanted to write together. Maybe over dinner we can outline them, and then as we finish our own segments, we can start putting the outline into full sentences, asked Eva, resulting in nods. Once we're done with our sections, we can start trading them around, said Brett. I think we're on track to have a full first draft by maybe Sunday night. We'll be damn close, said Eric. Who's on deck to read the draft? Andy, Josh, and Jason agreed to read it, said Eva. I want to go through a preliminary read-through first, if that's okay. I won't do the copy edits until it's in final form, though, since I only want to do it once. Do you want a hand? asked Eric. Sure, of course. The more the merrier. What comes next? asked Brett as he attempted to balance two dozen books in a stack. Um, dinner? responded Lauren. I mean, said Brett, once we're done with this thing. It's one thing to get all our thoughts down on paper here, but once we send it out to the news outlets, there's no going back. We haven't committed any real crimes yet, Eric said. Speak for yourself, said Ava. Show off. Lauren's smile quickly faded. Brett is right, though. We're calling for property destruction and inciting illegal activity. A conspiracy charge wouldn't be hard to prove already. I thought we made peace with that, all of us, said Eric, looking around the room. No, you're right, said Brett. I just want to point out that this is an inflection point on the graph of our activities. It's all well and good to dream about, even talk about how to make this world more livable in the long term. But once we hit send on this, it will shake out one of two ways. In my life so far, this is the only thing I've done worth going away for, said Eric. Careful what you wish for, said Lauren. Do we have the final distribution list? Well, said Ava, we've got indie media, digital media, and traditional media lists. Eric, you're going to produce the final document? My plan is to take our final document to the library, copy and paste the text into a new document, make a PDF, and scrub all the identifiable info. Adobe has these nifty tools where you can redact and sanitize a PDF to remove the embedded data, like the name of the author, type of word processor, and so on. Then I'll copy that PDF to a new flash drive, go to a different library. From there, I'll open a burner email account and send it off to our list. And you'll be wearing a disguise, asked Lauren. What, like a little goatee, sunglasses? Well, I'm not going to walk in with my face visible. Everywhere has cameras. Don't you think you're being paranoid? Would you prefer to do it? Well, no, said Lauren. I've 
got to keep plausible deniability until the end. I know, and I, I don't mind doing it, but don't give me crap, okay? You two sound like an old married couple, said Brett. Anyway, said Eric, we've got the indie outlets, Democracy Now!, Earth First, Inside Climate News, ALEC, Climate Denial, ProPublica, The Real News, Independent Media Center, World News, Vice, and The Intercept. Picking up the sheet, Eva continued. For digital media, we have the usual suspects, HuffPo, Breitbart. Wait, Breitbart? What's next, Stormfront? asked Brett. They're going to find out sooner or later, said Lauren. The more we get it out there in the first few days, the more chance it will be a real story. And even if they pan it, at least it's getting out there. If I can continue, said Eva, the dailies, that is, the Daily Beast, Daily Caller, Drudge, CNN, why the snickering? No, no, said Eric. They're in the right category. It's just sad and funny. Right, said Eva. CNN and the rest of the television news, NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, and their offspring, BBC and Al Jazeera America. Then we're on to the more newsy folks like Reuters, AP, AFP, New York Times, Washington Post, Chicago Tribune, USA Today, and so on. Oh, and then there's NPR. What about foreign press, asked Brett. Well, for this particular distribution, said Eric, I think we'll let them pick it up from the U.S. media, but I've been meaning to bring this up. We need to start some international outreach. I've got connections in Canada and Germany, but to pull this off, we're going to need similar movements abroad. I had always hoped it would just be a domino effect, said Ava. The U.S. is kind of a global linchpin. Right, but wouldn't it be nice if the dominoes were set up and ready to fall? But won't that make us more vulnerable here, asked Lauren. I mean, what if they get caught? I've got connections in South and Latin America, said Brett. I imagine we can get in touch, get the ball rolling, and not give them too many details about what we're planning. They are smart, and they'll see the manifesto, said Eric. They'll figure it out even if we give them an approximate time. Maybe best to tell them it's going to happen a week or two after the real date, in case the information slips out. Good idea. Let's give different dates to each place, and then it undermines the credibility of data. Then we'll tell them shortly before go time. Hey, said Lauren. Not to stop the conversation, but can we get a real meal for dinner? I'm sick of snack food. With smiles all around, everybody finished what they were doing and headed to the kitchen. End of chapter. Chapter 26, 2.2.2. Equity. It is understandable that people are worried about the disintegration of our current monetary system. Right now, many have invested in retirement, housing, medical insurance, and acquiring the things we feel we need to survive and even to live comfortably. It is rational to fear the loss of these things because in our current system, they denote security and stability. Unfortunately, the underlying system is about to be destroyed, either through a controlled and voluntary revolution or through unmitigated climate disaster. The future, though, is what we make of it. And that same security that many seek in the middle and later years can be achieved in a variety of ways. In small-scale societies, friends, family, and neighbors pull together to help when unforeseen problems arise. This is the original social safety net. Today we can organize this on a national, regional, local, or even household level. As we discussed in the previous section, the idea of individual survival of the fittest may not be the complete story, and this bears on our understanding of financial equity. Most organisms require food, water, and territory, but humans usually require clothing and shelter too. Humans also thrive in communities. Many societies seek to uphold a social structure whereby some live with more resources than others, and this division is presented as if it was inevitable, as if it was a natural law rather than a human invention. In our abundant world, it should be a right to have one's minimal biological, environmental, and social needs met. But today, so many live in want while a few experience abundance. Or in the words of Nass, quote, Human beings have needs. Any global policy of ecological harmony must distinguish the needs from mere wishes, that is to say, from wishes that do not directly relate to a need. To the extent that it is objectively possible, resources now used for keeping some at a considerably higher level than the minimum should be relocated so as to maximally and permanently reduce the number of those living at or below the minimum level. Note, NAS 1945A, page 44. End of note. Self-aggrandizement has become so much of our industrialized culture that it seems almost natural. Ethnographic studies do show some instances of people engaging in conspicuous consumption and self-promotion, usually in the tribe, chiefdom, and state societies. But the majority of human history was lived in bands, where community success was stressed instead of personal achievement. For example, hunters might trade arrows so that the kill can be attributed to both the one who shot the animal and the one who made the arrow. Even in settled agricultural communities, leveling mechanisms kept people from becoming too big for their britches. In those societies, everybody knows one another and communal gift-giving is often used to help those who need it, largely at the expense of those who are lucky enough to have extra to give. 
Status was raised by generosity, not miserly accumulation. As our societies grew larger and we no longer knew our neighbors well, individuals were able to amass great fortunes, while others fell far enough behind to live in poverty. We are not advocating for a strict socialism or communism as both embrace industrialization. Although we recognize that key aspects of Marx's theories are useful, and depending on what form it takes, eco-socialism may provide yet more creative solutions. In essence, his theory boils down to a few points. First, inequality arises when society is controlled by a minority of people, such as the aristocracy, industrialists, or business interests. Second, conflict arises from inequality, and when a few people have much more than others, tension grows. Third, needs are different from wants, and we cannot justify satisfying the wants of some while the needs of many are not being met. And fourth, people are fundamentally equal, and therefore no person should benefit more from society's production than anyone else. Thoreau aptly summarizes this belief, quote, As for the pyramids, there is nothing to wonder at in them so much as the fact that so many men could be found degraded enough to spend their lives constructing a tomb for some ambitious booby, whom it would have been wiser and manlier to have drowned in the Nile and then given his body to the dogs. End quote. Note. Thoreau, 1971, page 58. End of note. We agree that to live harmoniously, everyone must have their needs met and have a say over the conditions of their work and life. We do not depend on charity to lift the poorest among us out of poverty. Never in history has charity been able to reform fundamentally unequal economies. It is a poultice, not a cure. Again, in the words of Thoreau, quote, There are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root. And it may be that he who bestows the largest amount of time and money on the needy is doing the most by his mode of life to produce the misery which he strives in vain to relieve. End quote. Note. Thoreau, 1971, pages 75 to 76. End note. End of chapter. Chapter 27. Community Meetings. Winter, 2015 to 2016. It was a Tuesday evening in February. Rosie Fisher sat down in the creaking pew of a small church, now converted to theater and meeting space. She came to every monthly Tower Grove Neighborhood Association meeting. Rosie was a longtime resident of the area and had seen it change in the last decade as young whites moved in. Gentrification brought with it good and bad. While crime rates had declined and more houses were fixed up and occupied, rent was going up on her family, friends, and neighbors, causing many to move out. She was lucky to have inherited her paid-off home from her mother. As rents went up, so did prices at the grocery store. The local school was underfunded, but the new residents were often too young to have kids, and when they did, most moved off to the suburbs or, if the family stayed, sent their kids to private or charter schools. Nobody wanted to vote to raise property taxes to fund the school. The area was improving, in her opinion, but just not for her or the longtime residents. She was there to speak up about this problem and ask what the association was doing about it. She had written on her note card, Rent, Food, and Education, with bullet points under each. When it was her turn to speak, she let them have it. As she was speaking, she could see that some people were avoiding looking at her. She thought they looked a little ashamed or guilty. Others were nodding along with her and adding emphasis to her points with audible yeses, uh-huh, and that's rights. And one woman, with brown hair and a tattoo covering one of her arms, was grinning at her. It was a little unnerving. As she sat down, the association president thanked her for expressing her concerns, tiredly adding, again. Rosie was surprised to see the tattoo woman stand up next. The president introduced her as Lauren Bloom and said that she was representing a resiliency project she had never heard of. I was really moved by what Miss Fisher just said, she started. How can you have a community if people, your neighbors, are struggling to find housing, clothing, and education for themselves? You need passionate people who are willing to stand up for themselves to organize a community. And if Miss Fisher and the rest of the folks here aren't getting what they need from local government, maybe they should make the changes they need together. And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. I volunteer with a new organization called Citizens Resilience, which is trying to get people in communities just like this working together to build resilience into their neighborhoods. What that means is having a group that works to solve specific problems of housing, food, medical care, and education, not by voting for politicians who say they're going to tackle these issues, but by getting their hands dirty. For example, we have communities working together to create community gardens to cut food costs for their neighbors. This isn't a community garden where everyone rents a plot for themselves. This is citizens taking over abandoned spaces and growing large amounts of food together and then sharing that with the community. True, in a few cases cities have tried to stop them. Maybe you heard about what happened in St. Paul when they put a fence around the gardens and proposed bulldozing the lot. The media attention and public outcry caused the mayor to reverse position 
and the town council passed an ordinance that if owners hadn't developed a lot in three years, no one would be prosecuted for growing food on it. Imagine if the group had just asked for permission first. They'd have gotten nowhere. I'm here tonight to look for community leaders who want to get their hands dirty and just do what needs to be done. Lauren was looking right at Rosie. We'll support you with seed money and advice, but the projects you pick are up to you. I think you've already identified three areas to work on here tonight. I'll stick around after the meeting in case anybody is interested in talking. With that, she sat down, crossing her arms. The association president stood, glaring at Lauren. Thank you, but we don't need outsiders coming in and telling people to take the law into their own hands. I'd like you to leave. Lauren stood back up, pointing over her shoulder with a thumb. I live on Wyoming Street, which makes me a resident of this neighborhood. You're kicking out residents now? Rosie had stood up. Maybe if the concerns of the community members had been listened to before, she wouldn't have to advocate for people to take direct action to solve their problems. But that's on you, not her. So if you want her to leave, I'm going too. I'm tired of asking you for help. A flush had risen from the president's neck up to her face. Get out, she said, her voice tight in control. As Rosie and Lauren turned to leave, other members of the audience were getting up too. Some made eye contact with the board, others shook their heads. A few smartphones had been held up, catching the president's exchange with Lauren and Rosie on video. By the next day, word had spread around social media. By the next week, Rosie was holding meetings at her house to create committees. End of chapter. End of episode 12 of Eco Gorillas. For more, visit ecogorillas.com.